Hello, everybody, and welcome. We're going to go ahead and begin with tonight. Welcome to Jane Austen and Company Presents Food and Identity. And Jane Austen, my name is Anne Fertig, and I am a doctoral candidate in English and Comparative Literature at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, as well as the co-director and founder of Jane Austen and Company. We really are happy that you guys are here tonight for our first ever Zoom event. So bear with us today. If there's any technical difficulties, we'll try to work with you. Um, I also have the pleasure tonight of introducing our program and our authors. Jane Austen and Company is a free public humanities series hosted by the Jane Austen Summer Program. Our first series, which took place at Durham Public Library in 2019 and 2020, focused on historical female authors writing at the same time as Jane Austen. Our new series, which will be taking place monthly throughout the rest of 2020, focuses on staying home with Jane Austen, examining the domestic arts and social relationships as found in Jane Austen's novels. But tonight we have a very special program. We are delighted to welcome authors Sonali Dev and Sonia Kamal, both of whom have written amazing modern day adaptations of Austen's novels. Uh, for those of you who have joined us before with the Jane Austen Summer Program, you may recognize them from last year's program, where we welcome them and their texts as the center of our Pride and Prejudice and its afterlives. Well, we're happy to have them back tonight so they can talk about their novels again. First, USA best-selling author Sonali Dev writes Bollywood-style love stories, but let her explore issues faced by women around the world while still indulging her faith in a happily ever after. Sonali's novels have been found on Library Journal, NPR, Washington Post, and Kirkus Review's Best Books of the Year lists. She's won the American Library Association's Award for Best Romance, the Reader Today Reviewer Choice Award for Best Contemporary Romance, multiple Reader Today Seals of Excellence, is a Rita finalist, and has been listed, shortlisted for the Dublin Literary Award. She lives in Chicagoland with her very patient and often amused husband and two teens who demand both patience and humor, as well as she tells us the world's most perfect dog. <laughs> Last year for the Jane Austen Summer Program, we read her novel Pride, Prejudice, and Other Flavors, but she has also recently published a new adaptation called A Recipe for Persuasion. So Sonali, say something so they can see the book. Oh, I have to say something. <laughs> there you go. So here it is. <laughs> so we'll be smiling. discussing the one. Go ahead. Here, here's the two, here are the two, two editions. There you go. <laughs> so she'll be discussing uh, that new book with us tonight and maybe even reading a little bit from it. We are also happy to have with us Sonia Kamal, who is an award-winning novelist, essayist, and public speaker. She is the keynote speaker for the 2020 Jane Austen Society of North America uh, Louisville Festival themed in the library with Jane. And she is a speaker on the plenary panel at the 2020 JASA annual general meeting conference. Sonia's novel, Unmarriageable, Pride and Prejudice in Pakistan, which we also read last year for JAS, is a Financial Times reader's best book of 2019 a 2019 NPR code switch, a New York Public Library summer read pick, a People's Magazine pick, a Library Reads pick, shortlisted for the 2020 Townsend Award for Fiction, and more. I had to cut that list down because there were so many more honors <laughs> for that book. Her novel, An Isolated Incident, is forthcoming in the UK. Sonia's work has appeared in critically acclaimed anthologies including the New York Times, The Guardian, The Atlantic, TEDx Stage, The Georgia Review, BuzzFeed, and more. So you might also see some other faces with us here tonight. Um, these are our other lovely moderators who will be helping to make sure that the program goes smoothly. We're going to start out with a discussion with Sonali and Sonia, which will be moderated by Dr. Inger Brody, Associate Professor of English and Comparative Literature at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is co-founder and co-director of the Jane Austen Summer Program. Her primary interest is in the history of the novel in late 18th and early 19th century Europe 
in Meiji, Japan, and she has published extensively on Jane Austen. We also have with us here tonight, Emily Sfera, who will be moderating the chat discussion for the audience tonight. Emily is a graduate student and teaching fellow at UNC. She is interested in the gender politics of 19th century British women writers and the publishing history of their novels. She has volunteered with the Jane Austen Summer Program for several years, serving as registrar, and she's this year going to be our summer research assistant for Jane Austen and company. So during the initial discussion, as Dr. Brody is having a discussion with Sonali and Sonia, if you would like to submit a question that we might ask them at the end of tonight's talk, please go down to the chat function on Zoom. Make sure that you'll see a little above the chat box, it'll say two. Make sure it says two Emily Sfera. Emily is going to be collecting those questions so that everything goes smoothly and we don't have a hundred different comments or questions cluttering the chat box. So that's going to be towards the end, but you're welcome to submit questions throughout the evening and we will collect them and review them afterwards. <clears throat> so after the chat, we're going to ask you to stick around for a few minutes so that we can talk about our future programming. Keep an eye out on your emails as well tomorrow as we will be sending around some links to purchase these books and try out some of the recipes that we'll hear about. Please note that tonight's program will be recorded. So if you have to leave early or you would like to share it with somebody, you can pop onto our website afterwards and it'll be up for everyone. So with that said, I believe it is time for us to begin. Inger, would you like to take it away? Yes, thank you so much, Anne. Um, and thank you, Emily. And Anne and Emily put this together very nicely for us. Um, so Sonali and Sonia, it's so wonderful to see you again. And I've really enjoyed Sonali's new book and I can't wait for Sonia's. Um, <laughs> So I think it was the two of you who actually came up with this topic of food and family uh, for an identity for this, this conversation. So I wondered if you could maybe um, start by telling us a little bit about your own background and um, how food and identity played out in your own lives. Okay, well, thank you for having um, me and Sonali, both of us, and for hosting this. It's really exciting to be back with all of you. We loved being there last year in person. Um, you know, for me, I am an immigrant child, and now I'm an immigrant mother, which means that I've moved around a lot, a lot in my life. And um, I think the two constants that were always there was perhaps the weather which you know when you when you shut your eyes the sound of rain or the feel of sunshine on your skin and stuff you can sort of imagine you're in a different country in a different place so those locations become home but what also becomes home is the food that you're eating the, the, the food the cuisines that you pick up from different places which your family in, in my case first my mother and then myself began to incorporate in my kitchen and so why I, I have an essay called um, plating memory because it's in the New York Times but I realized uh, over time that when I would eat dal chawal or dal roti which is dal is um, yellow lentils one of my father's favorites I was actually even though he wasn't physically present I was sharing the plate with him when I eat Kashmiri sag which is collard greens mustard greens my mother's background is from Kashmir um, with white rice I was sharing the plate with her so so on and so forth and um, you know I in my first novel an isolated in Incident, food actually doesn't come up at all for the most part. I mean, it's there if the characters are eating, but it doesn't have a role in the novel. So I was really shocked, actually. It didn't occur to me what a big part food plays as a character in and of itself in Unmarriageable until people started saying, there's so much food here. We're going to a restaurant, but what about food? And then I looked back and I was like, oh my God, food as a character. <laughs> in this novel. So it actually came as a surprise to me because um, it, it was never meant to be. So it, it just happened. Uh, it, it just happened. So yeah. <laughs> How about you, Sonali? So, so it's amazing. That's a great, um, <laughs> great segue, Sonia. And um, hi, uh, of course, thanks everyone for being here. And thanks so much uh, for having Sonia and me on again. Um, I, this is really exciting. Um, and, and I have to say, uh, you know, it's been, it's been hard to uh, to, to promote a book right now. And, um, you know, it, it feels a little disingenuous to be doing that, but we're talking about community and we're talking about, you know, 
creating home. So, I mean, I did want to kind of um, mention that and not, um, you know, not, not act like really crazy stuff isn't happening in our world right now. But, uh, but having said that, you know, the fact that um, Sonia talked about the surprise of noticing that people are noticing that in your work from my very first book, um, you know, that seemed like the thing that everyone zeroed in on. And, um, and initially I was, I mean, I don't want to say I was bothered by it, but I was bothered by it because it was almost the sense of, oh, yum, the food, the food. I mean, mm -hmm. there's all this stuff going on in these books and everybody is the food. And it felt just the slightest bit like there was some sort of, you know, exotification lens mm -hmm. going on there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hmm, like what is going on? And I hadn't even noticed that I had put so much food in my book. But when you think about my life, and I, I mean, Inger, you specifically asked about that, is that in our family and growing up, so in, in the family I grew up in and the family I've built, um, you know, the, the number one way of, um, of showing love, of nurturing, of celebrating anything is food. Uh, you know, we, I don't think there's other ways that people celebrate things I, <laughs> I would like you to share with me because, um, because literally it is, you know, whether it's birthdays, it's, it's anything, right you're, 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 you know, your major focus, our, the major focus in our family has always been food. And, uh, you know, that's how my parents, uh, you know, rewarded us uh, when we did well in school with books and with food, you know, weirdly enough. It's a big surprise I turned out the way I did. But, but even um, you know, as, as an immigrant, um, I think the act of creating home uh, ha is so food related. Uh, this weekend, tomorrow, we are traveling to meet, you know, now that the world is opening up a little, we're doing a social distancing thing for a friend who's turning 50. And, and for the past four months that we have been talking about, you know, this, first we were talking about it because it was supposed to be a big shindig. And then we were talking about it in terms of, is this going to happen? And there was this particular dish that is a Parsi dish, which is, you know, which is this Indian community migrated from Iran uh, called dhansak. It's basically meat and vegetables and lentils cooked together. And she had, like, she couldn't stop talking about it. Uh, you know, and, and the act of actually going there without taking her some just felt wrong. And, you know, so, so I had to, and with everything going on, I, you know, so I have my husband running around to pick up the goat meat and all of this going on because I don't want to go celebrate her 50th without this food she's been craving. So it's, you know, so it is such an intrinsic part of my life and how I show you know, affection, uh, how I communicate that it would be ridiculous for it not to be part of my stories. Mm. And even in terms of stories, I think my exposure to food and cooking was my grand, my grandmother was both my grandmothers were, were one of 13 siblings, you know, and nine and 10 sisters. And our, my summers were spent with these grandmothers, you know, cooking things. And that's how I got to hear all the stories when I helped them in the kitchen. And so the whole storytelling, you know, in garb of gossip and opinion came from, uh, you know, came over food. So it's also tied up inside me that I can't separate it, you know? Hmm. That's fascinating. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure that everybody um, on, the, on the call has, uh, has read, has had the chance to read your novel. So I wondered if you would each be willing to give us a, a little snippet from, um, and Sonali, you could do your new book or your previous uh, Austin related book. I think you probably should do your new one, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sonia, did you want to go first? No, you go ahead. I'm so excited to, uh, you know, Sonali sent me um, Recipe for Persuasion. I loved her first, Pride, Pride Precious and Other Flavors. I loved the second one. I love what she's doing with this, with this series and excited to see what you're going to pick and um, what you're going to read. Yes. Thanks, Sonia. So, so um, you know, just a little background is that, you know, I had this childhood dream of, um, <laughs> you know, other people have childhood dreams of going to the moon. I had a childhood dream of <laughs> writing my favorite four Austin novels under one story umbrella. And, um, and, you know, I mean, this was actually stuff I gave thought to, like the Oscar speeches we give thought to, the, the fake ones, <laughs> we, you know, to our <laughs> bathroom mirrors. So, um, <laughs> so Pride, Prejudice and Other Flavors was 
the first one and recipe for persuasion is next and i'm uh, going to also do i'm currently working on the sense and sensibility one and then emma will be the fourth and they're all um set in uh, this uh, politically ambitious Indian American family that's descended from royalty, uh, the Rajas, because I was trying specifically to explore privilege and privilege in immigrant communities. And, and you know, how that whole, um, how the inbuilt class communication, um, you know, commu kind of immigrates with them um, and and how that fits into this world, which we believe is classless, but it really is not. And so, that's kind of that that's kind of the um, you know the home for exploring Austin's themes because my books, you know, unlike Sonia's Unmarriageable, is uh, you know are much more homages than they are actual retellings. So it really is more the themes that are in entirely um, you know in stories that are entirely my own. Um, and, and you would almost be hard pressed to find if you're looking for actual scenes and lines, you know, it's, it's all very coded. It's, it's not that clear. So I, I figured since you're all, uh, all, all bet bigger Scott, Austin scholars than I am, and literally all 54 of you on this call <laughs> probably are, because I'm, um, I consider myself more a fan and someone personally impacted by her, her, her characters and writing as a young person than, you know, than a scholar of any sort. And, um, and, and the only thing I'm probably a scholar of is, you know, cooking, but, but even that is not true. So, um, so, so I thought I'd pick the scene. Uh, I know Inga wants to, uh, wants a food scene, Anything <laughs> but, is fine. But, but, but I figured there is only one scene that, that, that you might be able to, um, you know, correlate to the original and it is uh it is this scene where um where so so this story is the story of ashna raje who is a chef and um who's been trying for the past 10 years to uh, resuscitate and you know to save her father's her dead father's failing restaurant and as a last ditch effort she goes on this food network show called cooking with the stars which is like dancing with the stars only with chefs and celebrities and of course the celebrity she gets uh, stuck with is um is the man you know she um whose heart she broke back in high school uh, and he believes it was because of familial pressure and um and he's back for closure so you know that's your that, that's your frederick wentworth and um and elliot um arc right there but but this scene is um is the scene where she is they've just gotten done with um with a cooking segment and um and you know how reality inger i think i they, did they lose me no no i, I can so. still see you okay oh. good all right sorry because my block shifted to Inger, so I was like, you know, maybe they can't hear me. So, so this is a scene, um, you know, in reality TV, typically they will have a point where they invite the families over so the audience can kind of, you know, get to see the real, uh, the, the real contestants. And so this is one of those, uh, those days that after the cooking segment, they have the families visiting and, and Rico is, uh, is is a world cup winning uh, football player which is soccer here um and and z is one of his teammates and uh, and rico's an orphan so z is his family and so he has left his honeymoon to visit uh visit the show and this is the first time he is meeting ashna and this is after the uh, after the cooking segment so here goes <coughs> sorry do you follow football i mean soccer Z asked Ashna, don't have time, much time for it, unfortunately. My old woman doesn't watch either, Z said dreamily. For the first time that day, Ashna smiled. Her flat out smile, the one that crinkled her nose. Tanya finds sports in general barbaric, Z said. But not sportsmen, thankfully, Ashna said, a hint of playfulness escaping into her voice. Z just got married. He's supposed to be on his honeymoon, but instead, he's here, Rico said. That seemed to shake Ashna. Everyone should have a friend like you. Well, this slug's not a bad mate either. Tanya and I wouldn't even be together after all these years if it weren't for him. 
Ashna didn't look at Rika, but he knew she wanted to. Sounds like you and your wife have been together a long time, she said, with the kind of genuine interest that would set her apart in an ocean of people. Since we were 18, you know how men are. If we imprint on you young, you've got us forever to do with us as you please. She smiled at Z so sweetly, Rico braced himself for what was coming. Or you men want us to believe that, so we can never let you go and you can use, your, use our dependence to do as you please. Z looked delighted. Are you saying men are more manipulative in relationships than women? That would go against the popular opinion, now wouldn't it? Ashna mirrored his delight. The popular opinion that men have floated through the years? I know a lot of women who agree that women are more manipulative than men, Z said. Hmm. Just like you've heard, women say women gossip more or pull each other down or only feel loved when men shower them with material gifts. Patriarchal opinions that centuries have been called the weaker sex and been given only the domestic space and our own bodies to claim our power with have had us internalize. Her smile wasn't quite so sweet anymore. Your Tanya, would you be with her all these years later if you truly believed she'd manipulated you into it? What would that say about you? I think that's about it. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> he makes a and good I, benefit. <laughs> thanks. I mean, I could go on, but I think I don't want everyone to fall asleep. And that's my um, handy dandy um, Jane Austen um, bookmark that I picked up from Chawton from Jane Austen's home. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Sonia, would you be willing to share some, something from Unmarriageable? Yes, of course. Um, so as Sonani mentioned, while hers are, you know, homages loosely based uh, uh, on the book, on, on Austin's books, Unmarriageable is um, very much literally Pride and Prejudice taken and set in Pakistan, where I call it a parallel retelling. Um, it follows the plot exactly, scenes are often mirrored, um, all the characters are there. And it was written with a very specific purpose in mind, which is that, um, as uh, I'm sure everyone knows, uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, etc., the whole subcontinent, South Asian bloc, was under the British Empire. And um, meant, the reason many of us are speaking English is because of the linguistic policies over there. Many of us are writing in English because of that also. And, uh, you know, so by dint of that, I myself grew up on British literature. And uh, what I wanted to do with Unmarriageable, I'm obviously a big fan of Jane Austen. Um, you know, I don't know if I, 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 I'll jump in and say scholar-ish, but, um, you know, but, uh, uh, studied her books, her life, everything extensively. But what I wanted to do was, and which is why I picked Pride and Prejudice for this particular project, I wanted to take a British classic and reorient it, if you will, and set it in a post-colonial country and talk about the legacy of colonialism when linguistics are involved in a post-colonial country. Um, you know, so that's why Unmarriageable is very much a parallel retelling. And you know, the, one of the most wonderful feedbacks I've gotten, most unexpected, a lot of stuff has been so wonderfully unexpected, was when Jainites who have really, you know, got, got, gotten behind Unmarriageable started telling me that, you know, you read a book or watch a movie for the first time, uh, you know, so you read your Pride and Prejudice, you read your Austin for the first time, you can't replicate that. But apparently, because this is the same plot, the same everything, they feel like they're reading Pride and Prejudice for the same time, for the first time. So that was a really huge, you know, things I weren't, wasn't expecting and, and, and stuff. But um, so what you asked for us to read a food passage and because things are mirrored, here is one that is and isn't. So this particular scene takes place at um, my equivalent of Netherfield Park, uh, Netherfield Ball. Um, and instead of Netherfield, what I have is Nadir Feed Wedding. So there's the name of the two, the guy and girl getting married, Nadir and Feed. And it's a play on Netherfield Ball. Their, their marriage is Nadir Feed Wedding. So my all my characters are here. Alice, who stands in for Elizabeth, Sherry, who stands in for Charlotte. And this is a conversation they have. And my Mr. Collins comes up too. 
And, um, you know, the role of food in Unmerishable, like I said, is for me, it's not so much what characters are eating per se, as much as it is a, a character in its own right when it comes to discussing status and class and what food means in a domestic sphere, in a party sphere, what it reflects on who's serving what. So, so here we are. Um, I wish a jerk like that would fall in love with me, a jerk like Darcy, Sherry side. You and Jenna are so lucky. She'll marry Bungles and you'll marry Darcy. Your mother is right, Alice. All you need is one rich man to become besotted with your looks and Junther Munther, abracadabra, your destiny is changed. Take so much more for those of us without looks. So unfair. It is unfair, Alice said, especially when good looking people complain how unfair it is that no one sees beyond their looks. Alice laughed dryly. Inshallah, Jenna will marry Bungles but there will be no such ending for me. I know why you're saying that, Sherry said. It's that Wickham, you're besotted by his looks. I don't get besotted by looks, Alice said. You should know that much about me after 10 years of friendship, Sherry. Sherry said, I know that you are human, but as your friend and well-wisher, let me advise you to put Wickham aside and focus on grabbing Darcy. Will you please not use that disgusting word, Alice said. You sound just like my mother. Grab it, grab it, Sherry joked half seriously. Grab Valentine Darcy because trust me, he wants to be grabbed by you. Alice, listen to me. Wickham seems nice, but Darcy has a lifestyle that only real money can buy. Alice shook her head. Money is not everything. And too many rich men have a tendency to be horrid because they think money stands in for character, decency and smarts. Money is a safety net for everything, Sherry said, that might not work out in life. Alice said, not if your husband is a control freak or a stingy hoarder. Sherry said, I really don't think Darcy is either. You two even share a love of reading. I don't want to share a love of anything with him, thank you, Alice said. And luckily for both Wickham and Darcy, I'm not a gold digger. I refuse to seek a rich roti. I'm going to make my own money and live happily ever after on my own terms. Sherry said, I can understand why your mother is always so irritated by you. You're a teacher in the Lipabad, and I know you don't look at or care, but you are getting older by the day. Would singledom be acceptable, Alice said, if I was still 20 and owned my own thriving business? No, Sherry said. Thought so. Alice dropped sunlight, which Darcy had given her, into the large cloth bag she was carrying instead of a delicate evening purse, much to her mother's exasperation. Dinner was announced and the two friends joined the surge of guests going towards the buffet in the garden. It was a feast of prawns, prawns being by far the most expensive delicacy in Pakistan at the moment. Tandoori prawn, prawn skewer kebabs, grilled prawns, prawn palau, penne prawns, deep prawn prawns, prawn jalfrezi, prawn korma, sweet and sour prawns, butterfly prawns, prawn fried rice, prawn stuffed paratha, prawn cutlets, prawn salad. Okay, Nadir Shah, Alice said, looking at the buffet, we get it as she and Sherry joined the buffet line. You can afford all the prawns in the ocean. And I thought the flowers they had at this wedding was ostentatious. I love prawns, Sherry said, taking heaping spoonfuls of each entree. I've only ever eaten them once. And even then we only got four each. This is why you marry rich Alice, an endless array of prawns whenever you want and prepared however you want. I think it's selfish. Alice spooned a small serving of prawn salad onto her plate. What about the people who don't like prawns or have allergies? Allergies, Sherry said. How sad to be allergic to prawns. And she followed Alice to the seating area where guests were having trouble setting their plates down amongst the floral table decor. Darlene came to their rescue and led them to a table he'd already cleared of flowers as best as he could. Aha, Colleen said, pointing to Sherry's full plate and then to his own. I see we have prawns in common. Yes, Sherry said, we do. Dear sweet Alice, Colleen said, your plate is shamefully empty. Allow me to pick prawns for you in the hope that my choice will please your palate. Oh, Alice stood up abruptly. Many thanks for your offer, Colleen Saab, but I see a friend I must talk to. Sherry here will be more than happy to keep you company. Alice smiled, smiled wickedly at Sherry. Please do discuss all the prawns you two have in common. And she goes <laughs> off. <laughs> That's lovely. Um, did you, did, did, were either of you inspired by um, food in Jane Austen's novels at all? Or did you, do you think that, um, that the connection, her connections to food and identity would be different 
from the ones that we have today or that you've both described? Well, I think, I mean, I think food, obviously the nature of it does not change over the centuries or anyone's table per se. I mean, you know, we, we, uh, we especially in Austin's time where they didn't necessarily have they, they didn't have TV and YouTube and everything that we have to soothe ourselves. I think food was probably one of the big soothers at the time. And then depending on what you could afford, how many courses you could afford, you know, I mean, it's always interesting to me how Mrs. Bennett is insistent that she's going to have two full courses when Bingley comes to dine, you know, she, and by courses, they meant, you know, they'd have many dishes at one time, but this was her way of showing that, um, you know, they could afford to have many courses. They could afford to have games meat and this that you know she tells Mr. Bingley that when he's done shooting all his birds he's to come on the estate and shoot so a lot of and, and you know and, and it's not that they just shoot for the fun of it they would actually be shooting and eating uh, what what the what the, the game that they shot so a lot of it is you know intrinsically um in a uh, 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 part and parcel of Austin's novels uh, we see like in Mansfield Park for instance we see the contrast between what the Bertrams are eating with the food that is available when Fanny Price goes back to her house uh, you know um, so Austin also I think shows status and class by how many courses are offered what sort of food is being eaten where um, so, so yeah, I mean, food, the, the nature of it definitely does not change. But I think as novelists, perhaps, putting food into a novel um, is always done with the intent and purpose of showing certain character traits or certain status traits or, uh, you know, it's not just it's not just a case of I feel that you know they're eating something or they're going somewhere uh, it's it's very much a choice that novelists, I believe, make on purpose what they're going to be eating and uh, what that means in the world of the novel. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's um, I think Austin specifically uses it. Like I think all of the devices she uses or many of the devices she uses to, uh, to comment upon the society she lived in, right? And to specifically cast a spotlight on, um, on class differences and on the fact that people very much wanted you to know where they stood in terms of class. And so, um, so, so, I mean, you know, the Elliots and the ice, right? I mean, they, to, to eat ice in summer um, it is a huge expense at the time. And, um, and, and it's a huge expense for a family that is completely bankrupted, right? And is, is refusing to give up the uh, give up the appearance of being um, you know of being wealthy so um you know so here you have Anne struggling with so so the building of her frustration with her people who have kept her from what she actually desires you know it's it's actually actually a device that pushes her forth on that journey and so you know i mean the fact that my family is actually being ridiculous and irresponsible and i gave up my happiness for this nonsense right and so her act of finding her spine which is that entire book um is you know the device of food and and especially food as a as a marker for wealth i think she does really well and of course she does it in um you know in 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 pride and prejudice too where she's continuously pointing out you know colin is extremely impressed with the table that that you know that um, Catherine de Bourgh you know puts out yeah. even when there's you know <laughs> there's no um, uh, no guests and so um, so and, and himself when he is uh, you know when he's selling himself as a husband too um, that's one of the things he uses you know as as the access to food that yeah. she would you know that his wife would have and so very much um, you know because. Um, in, in all of, and this has not changed in society over time, is that we are constantly looking for ways to preen about how we have more than others, right? Because, you know, you know I, I, I'm going to say a word about that there. I think over time, 
it's what has changed when it comes to feminism, I feel, or, or certain domestic spaces, which were relegated uh, to the women to begin with. Uh, you know, cooking was, and cooking was a full day endeavor. It's not that you could open the fridge and take out your, your you know, your, your breads and your sandwich meats and whatever. Uh, you know, you, you had to, you, you wanted that bread, you had to prepare it. Your ovens were not, you know, I mean, for, for cooking was a big deal, a bit, and it took women and and, and sometimes their entire day, day that like laundry did. But, uh, and, and one of my favorite parts, actually one of my favorite sentences in Pride and Prejudice is when um, Mr. Collins comes to the Bennett's house and he asks, you know, something like, um, to whom do I, you know, who do I thank? Which one of your daughters do I thank for this meal? And Mrs. Bennett very happily says, we can afford to keep a cook. And you know, when I first read Pride and Prejudice at, at age 16, that was, you know, because for me, it was quintessentially a Pakistani novel. It was set in Pakistan, Jane Austen was Pakistani, and it was these little bits that made it so because I could so clearly see someone coming for dinner to someone's house and you know asking well you know which of your daughters cooked this did you cook this assuming that maybe they couldn't afford to keep a cook the way Bennett Mr. Bennett sort of does or maybe he's just trying to compliment the girls and Mrs. Bennett because of her own background because of her own insecurities takes it the wrong way who really knows except what we're seeing on the page but you know and another favorite part was when um, Mrs. Bennett and Charlotte's mother quibble with each other you know, over, um, over the, 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 what it means to be a good cook. And, and I mirror that in, in, uh, in Unmarriageable also, where the two women are fighting over, uh, over Mr. Colleen through the realm of food. You know, Mrs. Bennett says that girls who have cooks have more time to spend with their husbands. Uh, Sherry's mother says, well, girls who can't cook are going to get divorced. And, and I have to say, my, my line, you know, there's a line I say where they both look at Mr. Collins, expect Mr. Colleen, my character, expectantly to see what his reaction will be. And he's busy eating because because as the narrator says, he can't be bothered to listen to the quarrels and foolishnesses of two elderly aging women. You know, he's too busy eating. And so, you know, and, and I think Austin does a lot of that also. Like, you know, she does show the status. She does show uh, all of that through food, who can afford what, depending on, yeah, all of that. So, so yeah, over the generations, it hasn't changed. But I think the amount of work that women have to now do in certain classes in certain countries in the kitchen seems to have definitely diminished and opened up their lives in ways that perhaps Austin, without servants, could not have envisioned. Because if you didn't, I mean, Austin shows us a class in all of her novels uh, and a class of people and characters who can afford to keep servants, who do the bulk of the work. You know, we never see an Elizabeth or Marianne or Eleanor or definitely not Emma slaving away in the kitchen or doing anything of the sort. They have servants, but we don't see, uh, you know, the others. And and with at least with my Charlotte character and Unmarriageable, I wanted to show the difference between an upper class, upper middle, and a lower middle class. So Charlotte, uh, my Charlotte, is in the kitchen all the time, and um, and that was a very fascinating way for me to take Austin's character and then go beyond it a little bit and show real class differences in modern day domestic spaces such as kitchens. So, yeah, it, and, it, and, and that's kind of true of all the things, right? I mean, it has, it's taking us much less time to dress ourselves. Ah, <laughs> uh, depends on that, depends. <laughs> <laughs> no. depends on on baby. Each and every one of well, I think, I think most of us can handle it alone at least, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and you're gonna be dressing up in Austin gear. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for the chamber pots, but I'm also grateful <laughs> that, the, that, that the corsets went away. <laughs> but, but also, I think you're absolutely right. Like, you know, in, in Indian families, um, the, the, so, so with, 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 you know, everybody being isolating at home, I was actually talking to, um, to an old school friend and um, and asking her how everyone is doing in the home and she lives with her in-laws and a, and a son and she said well everyone's fine and by God's grace we have a full-time cook with us right now <laughs> <laughs> I said well everyone else is fine is a was a more minor point to her than the fact that yes God's grace applied to the fact that they had a cook and yeah. and I will tell you that in three months of being home I understand what she's talking about. Yeah, yeah. Was that friend in India or in, in America? She was in India, sorry. I should have, um, you know, I should have <laughs> made that clear. But, but, but yes, and I, I also think one way that um, 
you know, in my personal life, um, a, a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of our growth in terms of feminism is what, you know, what we must do and what we can choose to do. And that's kind of, I think, what has, has also changed about women over time. Uh, and, and growing up, I don't know if this was the case for you, Sonia, but 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 being told, um, you know, that if you can't make lovely round rotis, that no one was going to marry you or, you yeah. know, to, to <laughs> impress your in-laws, you know, your the taste of your food, the whole, um, you know, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach thing, you know, it, it was just, and, and, and I think a lot of young South Asian women or, or, you know, or not so young, my generation, that's been their fight. Like that's been their stand against the patriarchy. Now I actually enjoy cooking and I used to really enjoy making rotis, but I made them after 20 years because, <laughs> of, because we couldn't go out and buy them at a grocery store. And I was in a rage for a week after that because every trigger of, you know, patriarchal trigger, everything I had ever heard, or, yes. you know, that was roti related just came up like this, you know, this explosion yeah. inside me. And I was yelling randomly at my husband yeah. and he's like, what is wrong with you? And I, I realized it was because I made rotis, you know, yeah. because, wow. you, the, you know, I, I, I have not, you know, out of all the things I did hear growing up about why no one was going to marry me, I was loud, I was opinionated. I, you know, if my dad smoked, I said, why can't I smoke? Lungs are lungs, man or woman. So, you know, I, I, I didn't bow my head and say, yes, whatever you say, I agree with it. But, you know, for some, for some reason, cooking never really came up. We, we always were in a position to, um, in the countries we were given the socioeconomics of those countries to have a cook. Um, my mother is a doctor, so she was often not at home, so she needed that extra help and stuff. Although she's a fantastic cook, and but you know, she the 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 the, the cooks would often come in and cut the vegetables, uh, do a lot of the preparation, and then she put the spices and stuff. So I've so I've grown up seeing my mother cook. And yet there was always help also. So I actually never learned to cook per se. It did so happen that in school, that in my um, high school, I took a food and nutrition class because back in the days it was set against, um, you either did physics or you did the food and nutrition course, but they didn't, they taught us to uh, do things like bake cakes. Baking cakes is a very upper middle class sort of thing to do. So, you know, ba just baking cakes and just things that you really can't feed a family on per se. So it's not like I learned to cook or whatever and chapatis and round roll and stuff was not something that I, I, I did not ever do that. But it wasn't until I came to the US um, to college and, uh, and even beyond. In college, I think I was at a friend's house visiting. I tried to make spaghetti and I literally put the spaghetti in cold water and, and turned it on and it was mush and I didn't know what the hell was going on. And, um, and it wasn't until actually once I got married and started having kids. And once you have kids, you need to feed them, you know? You need to, you need to get adept in the kitchen. You, the kids are hungry, they want to eat food. And I wanted to give them part of our, my culture, also Pakistani food, as well as, you know, other foods. So I, I started to, and I found out, I, I realized that I actually loved cooking. I loved it. But what I also, I mean, when, so for instance, so I loved it so much that um, um, if I've grown up seeing this with my mother, but when we had dinners at home, we'd have at least 12 dishes, 12 to 15 dishes of vegetarian and non-vegetarian. And that's what I'm used to seeing. So I started doing that. But what I also saw in, mod in contemporary times where a lot of people were getting a little upset with me over that, because on the one hand, the whole being in the kitchen and slaving for so long meant something different to some women. Um, and, uh, you know, it was more the, why can't you do takeout? Why can't we do pizza? And why do you have to spend so much time in the, and it, in the kitchen? And it actually took me a long time to realize that my enjoyment of cooking and my being able to cook those many dishes and serve them, it does not mean that I'm any less of a feminist or that I am endorsing some sort of barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen lifestyle than those women who uh, choose not to cook or do not, you know, do not enjoy it or whatever. And it took me, I, I can assure you, several years. I was so scared to put up 
food pictures that I'd made on social media, Facebook or my Instagram page or whatever, because I thought I, I just, it was something. And, and the first time I did, I thought I was going to get a barrage of comments saying, how dare you cook and you're putting us back, you know? And, and I was so pleasantly surprised to, and, uh, to, to realize that was not necessarily the case. And now I think, especially within this situation we are now, uh, you know, more and more people are discovering themselves and their personalities in the kitchen and what they're cooking, how they're cooking, making bread from scratch. So, you know, but it, but it is, I think, I think between the discourse of femininity and feminism, yeah. uh, cooking, can, cooking can be a bridge or cooking can be a barrier also sometimes to understanding where you stand between the two. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly, I think, you know, one of those uh, either deconstructing or, uh, or reconstructing our relationship with our own feminism and femininity. Because I think I was the only one of my friends in our um, socioeconomic peer group who learned how to cook. And I did it because of the things I said, where, you know, because when I was young, you know, my grandmothers, and I was there with them, and I was fascinated by it. And it was like such a such a joyous thing for me to absorb those stories and be kind of encased in that, you know, that wonderful feminine, like, you know, tightness. And, and so I, I actually loved it. And I had, as a young girl, my friends roll their eyes at me. Like, why are you like, what is this? This is ridiculous. Right. And, um, and I didn't, and, and it was, it, it, it was a thing that I had to figure out for myself that just because I like to cook doesn't mean it's my role. And it has, of course, you know, I mean, all marriages have three people in them, the two spouses and the patriarchy. And so at least- No, the two, two spouses marriages. and the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the dishwasher. <laughs> and, 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 and this is so tied up with patriarchy where you want to claim your love of a thing, but- a million other things get in the way, you know, what does that make me? I don't, you know, I, I'm not interested in that, but so much of it is conditioning. Why do I feel responsible to feed my children? You know, and, and why does my husband not feel that, you know, when he cooks, it's a, oh, I feel like cooking today. And it is this, you know, uh, this act of uh, entertainment. But when I cook, it's, you know, it's, it's just my job. And so all of that is so tangled up. I think that there's also this false dichotomy in the background, at least in um, uh, American culture, between uh, cook and chef, where cook is often domestic and gendered feminine, and, and chef is off, is, tends to be professional and gendered masculine. I think that that, that false dichotomy. Yeah, I, I think, and I think, and even in Pakistan, I would say for the longest time, the, the same. Um, uh, being a chef necessarily uh, or, or cooking in restaurants and stuff um, is, is, is over the past few years begun to be seen as a more respectable profession, which upper middle class, uh, upper class people can do too. But when you go out in the bazaars and in restaurants and stuff, usually you will see all male staff in the kitchen for the most part. So, um, and, and, I, and, and I've always been so amused and bemused by that, which is in the houses usually where women are cooked with if they don't have domestic help it's always the women in the kitchen like Sonali said making the rotis the chapatis being judged on how round those particular breads are yeah. you know is the salt right is the salt not right all that sort of stuff but when you go to the restaurants it's always the male chefs and the same thing sort of for the longest time I remember when the food network started there were so many male chefs you know men cooking and men taking the accolades and men traveling the world with their cooking shows and bringing food food culture to us um, and, 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 the, and, and you know it's just astounding considering for centuries upon centuries it's women who have been doing the, the cooking the nurturing the feeding the everything but it's the it's the male that sort of take that um, so yeah it's it's a very interesting dichotomy which is why like in um, recipe for persuasion uh, Sonali's new book Ashna is, is female you know though she has her issues with cooking and stuff um, but nevertheless you know she is a female chef there so we, we do see that Absolutely. I think we're going to open it up to some audience questions now. They've been accumulating, so we don't want to have people wait too long. I think one of the big ones is, 
are you guys planning any cookbooks in your future? <laughs> you know, I, I get at least, oh, I get so many requests per day asking when my character Sherry, who loves to cook in the novel and is a phenomenal cook in the novel, one of the reasons why Mr. Collins chooses to marry her when Sherry's cookbook is going to come out. Now, the thing is, I am, I, I love to cook. I've been told I'm a good cook, but, but the opening a restaurant or catering or writing a cookbook has never been something I've necessarily thought of. But from Sherry's point of view, it, it would make an interesting little pamphlet or something or the other. <laughs> so never say never, I guess. But um, but yeah, I, you know, the, the other thing with me is that I am not a precision ingredient cook. I throw things in. If you give me four ingredients, I will throw some, I will throw them in a pot and I'll make something out of it. So when my brother came out to college in the US, I was already, I'd come out to college, but I was married by that time. And he'd call me up for recipes and he'd say stuff like, how much salt do I put? Now, I found that question so bizarre because put as much salt as you want, under salt it. You can always put salt on the table. What do you mean, how much salt do I put? So I just throw things in. And, and I'm a very smell-oriented cook, you know? I can smell the, you know, the scent and I know that, okay, it needs a little more cumin or a little more coriander or turmeric or more tomatoes. And I'm a fearless cook when it comes to it. I just throw things in <laughs> and cross my fingers and something or the other, it's always edible. <laughs> Except for that first spaghetti I made. That was, that we still ate it, but it was mush. <laughs> what about you, Sonali? Yeah, I, uh, you know, so the same, I, you know, I, I completely um, am flummoxed when people ask me for quantities and, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, and measures of things. And so, in fact, uh, while that's true on one hand, um, you know, my, my mother-in-law and my mom, there are things that they make that, you know, that are just so pitch perfect that I have stood by them and made them measure things and then written them down. And, you know, and, and, and of course my mom and my mother-in-law, like as different as two women can be both lovely women, but completely different. And if you ask my mom for a recipe, she takes about four hours <laughs> to tell you because she's like, sit down get a pen and paper and then everything has a side note and a footnote and then that footnote has a footnote and so that's her recipes and my mother-in-law is like oh what recipe it's just so simple what recipe and so I have to stand with her and then you know kind of see what she does and so 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 certainly um you know I, I think that um that to get started with something a recipe is great but um but I'm certainly a cook who, who, who goes by, ta you know, taste and smell, which is why I don't like baking because it's out of my hands once it's in the oven. I'm like, oh, I don't know what's going on in that oven, you know, and I don't really enjoy that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, to lose the connection with that food and then have it come out to me completely done is, you know, I love the alchemy of watching. Mm -hmm. But, but com coming to the uh, recipe question, I, um, if you, if you sign up for my newsletter, the thing I have going on right now, because I heard this so much, uh, you know, so many demands for recipes that I have a little ebooklet that you get, you know, for free when you sign up for my uh, newsletter. We're still working on it, but it's, you know, it's the, it's the carrot, <laughs> if you will. I include that link when we sign but, up. Yeah. Yeah. For signing up for it. So Sonia, this is a good idea also, you know, <laughs> if, to get people to. And, and the other thing that, you know, that I didn't come up with that the person who works on my newsletter did was we have, you know, every one of my books, I have a recipe from the book. Mm -hmm. And then what I do with my newsletter, which is, you know, comes out not even once a month is I do the three R's and that's a recommendation, mm -hmm. a recipe and a really bad joke <laughs> because my okay. family sends me bad jokes and I guess I'll spread the love. But, but so, so recipes are very much, uh, you know, something I put out. Um, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I can actually tell a really, really bad joke right now. When people tell me this joke, I don't know what they want me to say, what response they're expecting, but here it is. Knock, knock. Who's there? Sonia. And yet so far. Sonia who? There you go. Sonia who? Sonia, yet so far. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. And I back away. <laughs> please, someone laugh. Someone please laugh. We're all laughing on the inside. <laughs> okay. But bad joke. This is, this is your next bad joke in your next newsletter. Link you got it. You can say Sonia. This is okay, we have some more questions from the audience. 
Um, let's see, what's the next one, Anne? So one of our audience members mentioned that Sonali's excerpt reminded her of Northanger Abbey and Pride and Prejudice. And she's wondering, did any of you seek inspiration in Austen's other novels while writing your adaptations? I, you I know, kind I, of I love, love that question because, uh, sorry, Sonia, I, no, no, go do ahead. you want to go first? I, I, the reason I love that question is, you know, uh, the fact when you think in terms of influences, right, um, so much of, um, of who I am, uh, you know, or who, who what I learned about being a woman early, because I think Jane Austen's books for me were some of the first books in which, you know, women actually had opinions and desired things and got them and didn't end up in a mental asylum or dead, you know, or both. Uh, you know, she was one of the first and, and, and it was kind of delicious because what I believed about myself in terms of self-worth, because she, she's probably the only um, author of that time. And again, you know, not a scholar, but, but from my reading and what I was given exposure to, women, you know, she had enough self-worth that I think she translated into her female characters where she, she dared to desire things and then they got them, even if it meant saying no to the richest man and, you know, one of the richest men in England and having destitution be your option. You know, if you thought the man was a jerk and not worthy of you, you got to say no. And so in those terms, like that was the stuff I leached out of her novels. And so not just not not just these four homage novels, but all of my novels obviously have, uh, you know, have some, um, some influence and some visible influence that shows from all the people that, you know, all the authors um, that that I idolize and Jane Austen is certainly that and and even other influences like you know Bollywood films I grew up with so 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 some of those stories are just you know I've internalized them and they're so um you know so inherent in me as a person so when I'm thinking about things my mind will automatically go to a scene in a, an Austen novel or in a Pula Desh Fande piece or in, you know, uh, you know, in Kabi Kabi or some sort of Bollywood film I grew up with. And, and so naturally when I'm trying to tell a story, all of that threads into it. So absolutely. I mean, I don't think um, it is, oh, this is persuasion and therefore it is only persuasion because just naturally inside of me are, you know, all these other things. Yeah. Um, I think for me, uh, you know, when I was writing Unmarriageable, there was so much I wanted to accomplish and do in that as well as keep the tone light, bright, and sparkling, which was what Jane Austen wanted to do with Pride and Prejudice herself. In fact, one of my epigraphs is um, an excerpt from a letter that she wrote to her sister Cassandra saying, you know, I should have an essay on this and I should have more on this and it should be heavier, but you know, but it's light, bright, and sparkling. So I wanted to keep true to that. But I did want to put in a lot of ease. You know, Unmarriageable is a complete standalone novel in its own right. If you know nothing about Jane Austen and, and there are those people and if you've never read Pride and Prejudice, then, you know, you can absolutely come to Unmarriageable and, and, and hopefully still enjoy it as a standalone novel. But because it was a parallel retelling um, of Pride and Prejudice, what I very much wanted to do and have done is put um, Easter eggs throughout it. So actually Harris Big Wither makes an appearance, Cassandra's um, late fiance makes an appearance, but all the six books are in Unmarriageable. They're Easter eggs and you have to search for them a little bit, but, you know, if you get, you'll get the reference. So Mansfield Park is there, Emma's there, Northanger Abbey is there, uh, Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, obviously, uh, Persuasion, all the novels are there. And the first one is very easy, actually. Mans the opening of Mansfield Park is my absolute favorite. And Mansfield Park, no, no secret, is my favorite Austen novel. And um, I think the opening is brilliant. It's three sisters who get married to three men from just different socioeconomic backgrounds. And literally those rings on those fingers determine the course of their lives, as we see with Lady Bertram versus Fanny Price's mom. And, um, and, and then very much the lives of their children also. And so my first nod or Easter egg was my opening to Unmarriageable. The very first chapter opens with, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a girl can go from pauper to princess 
or Princess to Pauper in the mere seconds it takes for her to accept a proposal. And that was my sort of nod to Mansfield Park and the opening. I mean, yes, it's Pride and Prejudice with the universal, uh, you know, in, in, in a different form, uh, because I wanted to bookend Unmarriageable with Austin's opening sentence for Pride and Prejudice and then um, my own. But, um, but yeah, Mansfield Park. So yeah, all six novels are in Unmarriageable. And, um, and I, you know, I'm still waiting for everyone to get it. A lot of people get a lot of the obvious ones, but I have to say North Anger Abbey is such an underrated novel. I actually did book, uh, book clubs uh, across uh, in a lot of different places with all six of, I, I led them with all six of Austin's novels. And North Anger Abbey continuously seems to be the one book that even a lot of the avid Austin fans tend not to have read. I think they get scared by the whole gothic element of it. You know, again, like Unmarriageable, you do not need to know anything about gothic novels to enjoy North Anger Abbey. It's almost like a young adult novel. It is brilliant, brilliant. Please read North Anger Abbey. <laughs> <laughs> That's my plug for North Anger Abbey. <laughs> All right. What else? We have another couple of questions, I think. Yeah, one, one listener was really interested in when Sonali mentioned this idea of exotification and was wondering if you guys might expand on that idea a little bit. Okay, I'm trying to think in, in <laughs> oh, with the food. Yeah. With the food. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to understand the question a little bit better because, um, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, um, it's obvious almost, I think, how, um, how, a, how a lot of reactions to our books um, are obviously, you know, the lens to them is, is very specifically exotic, I think. Um, you know, I, everything from, um, you know, I read my one Indian book for the year, and this was, you know, this was great to, um, you know, to just, um, you know, this, oh, it's to, to just like, oh, there's so much curry in this or, you know, it, it's so, so I'm trying to understand the question um, is that, that that's a, when we, when we set out to write as South Asian women, trying to tell authentic stories from our felt experience um it's even though the story is a universal experience and i do think both our books are very very universal now, of course i'm going to feel that way because you know there is no there's no um sense of trans there's no translation i need for them but even objectively i feel like the experiences are are, are not experiences of uh you know it's there's nothing there should be nothing in there that's alien to you as a human experience and yet when when you read reviews or you meet readers you do get that sense that they're trying to i'm trying to understand your people you know there's that you know there's that filter of exotification which is almost um you know again universal um and and um and and one of the things that I that is always kind of most surprising to me um, when I meet readers is them saying, you know, I just it was so relatable, and I I try to understand what that means, and I'm like, did you think they were vampires? Who also, by the way, you find relatable, <laughs> but like, what is that? What is that? You know, a how is that review going? You know, why are you telling me that you found someone who? Um, looks and talks like me relatable um you know i'm uh, it, thank you is the only thing i can say so i think that that jumping into it with the perspective that this is going to be something that may or may not be relatable uh and therefore walking by a book that that doesn't look like your space that's uh you know that that that's a bridge and hurdle that we have to cross because 200 years of training uh, have trained the readership to accept white books as neutrality, right? And to kind of seek that out. And so, so of course, we're fighting, uh, you know, the, the, the exotification lens, if that was the question. Yeah. You know, um, I have to say, I have been very pleasantly surprised with how uh, unmarriageable has been embraced and 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 loved 
by all the readers in the US and in Pakistan and around the world. I get messages from so many people in different countries who've read it saying that, oh, this, this book is this family, this book is just like us. And, and the fact that they can, you know, it's, 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 it's gratifying to see how people are recognizing that no matter the cult, no matter the table and the cuisine served, food is, just, is still food. You know, there's a nourishing element to it. There's a, there's a, a garnishing element to it and that they're able to see uh, books from different cultures. And, and when I say they, I mean people who are not of that culture. You know, when I read a book by a Chinese author, by, um, by someone who is not of my culture. It's, I, I, my background is such, having grown up, like I said, on, on, on the books of Western civilization, I very quickly had to learn to see the universality in stories. So I would start to flip things in my mind. So scones would become samosas, bonnets would become dupattas. You know, everywhere, if, if it was Margaret, uh, if it was Judy Blooms, are you there, God, it's me, Margaret, set in New Jersey. So it would, for me, it would be Lahore in Pakistan, where I'm from. You know, so I quickly began to see what my be perceived as other as just another face for myself and I think with unmarriageable what I'm finding a lot of people doing because unmarriageable is not an immigrant story at all it's set in Pakistan all the characters are Pakistani it is it is not about an immigrant family and their woes and adapting and this that which perhaps you uh, readers in the west are more used to reading this is a this is the unmarriageable is completely set in Pakistan and they're seeing a Pakistan that unfortunately our news and where what they know of Pakistan they've never seen before uh, my characters go to the theater they go to the cafe to you know complain about the Darcy's and their mothers they, they're seeing Pakistan in a different in a different lens. And um, I, I, you know, the word exotification, I think, has a history in the U.S. at least, where, which is related to a lot of purple prose, where immigrants and immigrant cultures, and once again, we're centering the white readership. What has always interested me is when immigrants read books of each other, you know, when I read the books by a Chinese author, Japanese author, a Nigerian author, and, and how, I, how I'm able to see those settings, those, uh, those dilemmas that they've discussed is very much my own. And I think with Unmarriageable and a lot of books, you know, coming out, but maybe because Unmarriageable is completely set in Pakistan, readers who have not traditionally read anything other than perhaps immigrant fiction, uh, even if it is set in another culture, with Unmarriageable are reading a novel completely set within Pakistan soil and culture and seeing themselves reflected in that. And I think it's, it's very gratifying for me, but I think it's very interesting um, for them also because, you know, I have readers from everywhere telling me this is just like us. And I'm like, I'm so glad to know that you're Pakistani. So, you know, um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Or should I do that? Um, so, uh, Sonia, you wrote a, a wonderful piece about tea that I read, uh, <laughs> which I absolutely loved. Um, and tea yeah. comes up very prominently. Uh, chai in its various forms and uh, mixtures comes up very prominently in both of your books. Um, and interestingly, that's one of the contemporary associations with Austin is, is tea as well. I've seen many memes about Austin and tea and there's even a, you know, the Bingley Tea Company. Um, so I'm curious, like, what is it about tea and tea and memory? Um, and maybe if you're, if you're interested, um, how the, the Indian or Pakistani tea rituals are similar and different from the tea that Austin would have experienced. Yeah, you know, I, the, the word ritual is so funny because I don't, when I make tea, which is 24 hours of the day, I mean, even whether I drink it or not, I constantly have a cup of tea next to me. And um, it's, when I make it, it's not, it's not a ritual per se, it's just, you know, if I'm doing it with, with, with tea leaves, it's in, the, it's, in the, it's in the saucepan with the water, with the milk, with the, I don't take sugar, but otherwise sugar. If it's with tea bags, plop the tea bag in your cup, put the water on top, put the, you know. So, so it's, it's such an everyday sort of thing for me. It's like filling a glass of water up. And the essay that you referred to, it's on, uh, you know, and serious, it was when I first came to the US, I came to college over here in the early 90s. And I did not to pack, think to pack any tea with me. And I remember, uh, you know, the first week, someone took me to the grocery store and there was a shelf of teas. And there was, oh my God, there was raspberry zinger and lemon and blueberry, God knows what, and 
oh my god there was every tea except tea tea there was no like there was nothing that said tea you know and it turns out that it was on the shelf it was what was called orange pico but i didn't know that orange pico is not orange orange it's it's tea so i came back very disappointed with with one of the people over there gave me a packet of uh southern sweet tea and they said well just you know anyway it wasn't the same and it's all in the essay and about how you know um you know even uh, the essay is basically about how something can be right in front of you but if you don't know the names if you don't know the words the identification of how how home can morph into different labels and words is that home still there even if it's staring you in the face and then i have a recipe for a really rich uh, concoction, dessert tea almost, at the end of that essay, um, you know, and, and I think it ends with, you know, welcome to my home or something. So, so yeah, but I will say, and I think Sonali can back me up, in Pakistan, usually when we put spice in tea, for the most part, it's cardamom. No one puts anything else. When I remember my best friend who was Indian. Um, I was at her house the very first time, and she started making tea for me. And oh my God, she started, she put the cardamom, and she started grating the ginger, and she started putting other things. And I was like, are you going to put green chilies in this? What are you doing? I just want tea. And, and I think, I, so I think the, the Indian masala chai, it has, a, has many more spices in it than I think the Pakistani tea, which is usually, um, you know, a lot of sugar, very, if it's, the, the more milk you put in it, the richer it is. But usually if it's going to have a spice in it, for the most part, it's cardamom. For the most part, though now I do so I do put a little bit of ginger in my tea now. <laughs> I have a fusion and Pakistani Indian. I have my own fusion tea now. So. <laughs> yeah. For, for me, it's uh, you know I'm I'm a complete Chai Nazi and I'm also an absolute addict. So I cannot wake up in the morning if I don't. You know, it's it's almost like I'm a zombie until I get to my kitchen, hold a piece of ginger and grate it into water. <laughs> And there's the ginger yes, it's and, and my my chai is ginger like that's the note and if i can can find lemongrass then it's lemongrass so this is what i've grown up with you know my parents house that's the smell that wakes me up and you know in in my home the best thing like the greatest treat on my on my birthday if you know even if he doesn't do it any other time for someone to have a ready hot cup of ginger chai for me it's like I will basically die for you <laughs> so it's it's very much and, and it's the worst part about traveling and we travel extensively I love everything about it I love being on planes but the thing that I miss is you know is and and, and I think that's one of my meters of how I'm aging that I'm grumpy without my chai and, and, and I miss my chai when I'm away from home. So, so it is, um, it's an emotional place of rightness for me, that right yeah. chai. And I think that translates to, um, to Ashna's relationship with tea because we're also talking about a character who, um, who is in a place she doesn't want to be in. So she, she doesn't want to be doing what she's stuck doing that she feels, uh, you know, guilt bound to do and so we actually have a chef who has a very complicated relationship with food and her little pressure valve that kind of you know is her relationship with tea and in the end she finds her way to you know to smoothing out her relationship with food through that connection you know how do I because she says that I imagine this flavor and then to get to that exact note I tweak things I put in. And so she obsessively works with her teas to get that flavor that she has imagined that she relates to an emotion. You know, so she gives names to her feeling, uh, you know, to her teas. And then when she's able to translate that to food, because she feels lost about the food because she has so much self-loathing that's tied up with it. And, and, and so chai is actually her way to discover, you know, to, to recalibrating her relationship with food and therefore with herself, uh, you know, and how she sees herself in the world. So, um, so certainly I feel like Chai has that power. Now my pet peeve is tea that does not have tea in it. So <laughs> please don't come at me with your lavender teas and your, you know, teas that don't have, like the first thing a tea needs to have is tea. <laughs> you can put other things in it. And, and so if you're Starbucks and if I really am desperate and I have to get your chai then the first thing that's going in that is some black tea a black tea bag 
And trust me, if you ever order um, um, Starbucks or any of the cafe chais, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting you give your money to that. But if you really have, uh, you know, have the, um, <laughs> have the craving for it and you get it, just put pure, you know, a tea bag of pure black tea in it. And then it will magically turn into actual chai because there will be chai in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um like i said whether i drink it or not because how i mean after 20 cups of tea how much more can i have nevertheless it is always by my writing desk by my bed I, I i just care yeah it's it's just part and part it's just i don't even know when i started drinking tea honestly it just happened it's so weird i don't know you know, I, I don't, I ask many, I ask many Pakistanis or Indian South Asians, do you remember your first cup of tea when you started and before you became addicted to it or became, it became your, you know, your, your familiar instead of a cat, your teacup is your familiar and no one seems to, I certainly don't remember. It just, I think I started out with a, what we often do in Pakistan and India also is you dunk biscuits or what is in the U.S. cookies, but in, in, in that British empire lingo, you know, post-colonial lingo biscuits. And so, you know, you dip you with your parents are having tea and they're dipping their biscuits and they give you a bite because I know that's how my kids are doing it you know they're that's how my they're kids tasting, are doing it yeah, yeah they're how, tasting and, that biscuit and getting a feeling for that so I think that's what it is yeah <laughs> that's that's how my son has now started to drink it he's going to be 21 but funny story is our puppy so so my, my puppy has uh, has a ritual every day at about 3.30, my husband gets his cup of tea and his you know, plate of biscuits. They sit down in this particular corner of the couch. He comes, sits down next to my husband. And if you dare to give him a piece of biscuit that's not been dunked, he will spit it right out, give you a look. And then, you know, you have to give him a piece that has been dunked and, you know, he, so so even my dog knows not to wow. eat this that's not dunked in tea. <laughs> you know, we just got a comment saying this conversation about tea makes me want tea even more, even though I just finished a whole pot of tea, just Same. like the books, it made me want to eat even if I wasn't hungry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I always like I always say, Pakistani and Indian restaurants need to, especially Pakistani restaurants, need to give me a cut of their sales. And the number of people who have gone running to one of them after reading Unmarriageable, apparently, so I'm told. So, yeah. Yeah, well, all the time. Like, we have eight minutes left, so is there Anne or Emily, do you have one last question? Um, I think we're good on questions. If you guys, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are so pleased to have you. And everybody who's still listening, watch your inboxes tomorrow because we're going to be sending you some treats, some recipes and pictures that they've sent us. So if this really has whetted your appetite, maybe you can go and uh, try out some of these recipes. So before we leave tonight, we would love to talk real quick about our next program, which is once again about food. I believe uh, a few months ago, one of our Jane Austen and, and company regulars suggested we do a program about food, and now we're just doing everything about food. So <laughs> June 30th at 5 p.m. EST over Zoom, we will be talking about food from Austen's novels. So we've talked about food in these adaptations. We're going to be talking about cooking practices, eating, dining in Regency era England. This is expert. with <laughs> food historian and blogger Catherine Highsmith. If you're hungry from this talk, I do not recommend you go to Catherine's Instagram because you will become even hungrier. She is amazing <laughs> with the things that she creates. And no promises yet, but we are trying to convince her to kind of uh, show off some of her Austin recipes that she's used. So that'll take place on, once again, on June 30th at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can once again register by going to our website, janeaustinandco.org. Furthermore, if you want even more Jane Austen, Jane Austen news, Jane Austen adaptations, Jane Austen readings, come visit us at janeaustensummer.org. The Jane Austen Summer Program, or JASP as we affectionately like to call it, is a four-day symposium that in a normal time, takes place in June in Chapel Hill. We've moved this year's program to next year. It will be on Jane Austen's world. Each year we do workshops, 
small group discussions, lectures, a Regency ball, and other activities. So if you're interested, please visit our website where you can view our program. Once again, Sonali, Sonia, thank you so much for tonight. This was a wonderful talk. Thank you, everyone. And thank, thank you, you all so for coming. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Inger, Emily, and everybody who tuned in. Thank you. This was so fun. Now I'm hungry, too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me, for having us. This has been an absolute ball. I almost feel like I'm back where we were last summer. It's been, it's been absolutely wonderful. And um, yeah, I'm going to go make myself a cup of chai. <laughs>